Hi, Jonathan. Hi there. How are you? Good. How you doing? Good. I think I'm double. I'm going to mute something. Okay. How's that? Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, good evening, and uh, I am happy to welcome you to the second total essay of our two part series presented by our Laurel Hill. Uh, we're delighted to have Laurel tonight, and Laurel has served on the Sylvia Arts Council for many years. She's been our chair. We've got to enjoy lots of her photos through the hundreds of flyers she's made over the years for the Arts Council. And she has worked tirelessly for the council and for our community. Tonight, oh, we all, uh, we've all seen Laurel bundled up walking around in the middle of the winter in her short sleeves in the summer. And she always has a big camera with her. And she's always touching magic moments. So. Uh, tonight, through her presentations, seeing Sonoria through a changing lens will get to enjoy even more. I would like to mention three other events that are going to be happening in April. One coming up soon, Sunday, April 10th. Cindy, hi Cindy, I see you there. Uh, we'll be leaving the Spring Bird Walk, and I think we'll be driving downtown and enjoying the Audubon Trail and Outside Beach. And we encourage all of you to come out and enjoy the hard years of spring. Then on April 22nd is our Earth Day, is Earth Day, and we'll have our annual Ocean Film Festival. Um, that'll be on Friday night. And then we have one more, our third photo essay coming up in late April, and that'll be presented by photographer Norm Olson. So we hope you will tune in for that in a second. So we'll turn it over to Laurel. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Tanya. All right, just going to recap. I heard that there's going to be a spring bird walk with Tanya and Cindy on April 10th, then the Ocean Film Festival on April 22nd for Earth Day. And I bet that's going to be done online, right? Or will it? It'll be, it'll be a gathering oh it'll be a gathering okay great and then uh bjorn will do a photo essay and you know they're getting ready to go do a trek of the arctic again he and kim are getting ready to fat bike up there so that'll be exciting to hear about how that all went as well so okay well i'm just going to go ahead and get going with the presentation and um i'm going to do some screen sharing here for a second Well, the fun thing about doing a presentation about Soldovia, and Tanya, I'm gonna just speak to your, I'm gonna have my back to you, I hope that's okay. Okay. I can turn too. Look, we can do this. <laughs> All right. So the fun thing about um, doing a presentation about Soldovia with Soldovians is that I think we all have a shared, a shared love of the place obviously. And um, I think each of the people that are on this, this uh, Zoom right now, with the exception of one name that I didn't recognize, um, I think each of the people here have brought their own artistic view and vision to our Soldovia experience in different ways. And so when we think about Tanya and Cindy, uh, they look at, they look at Soldovia's nature and Aaron as well and Brett, you know, when I see their photos and I see Seldovia through their eyes, it's, it's things that I will never experience myself uh, if, if I hadn't seen it through their lens. And Valisa's canoeing or rowing to, to work at her studio around the other side of Backers Island and going to Schooner Beach, I wouldn't have experienced that without she took the time to capture it and share it. And um, so to me, I just wanted to thank each of the people here for the inspiration that you are in, in how we love and get to explore and enjoy Saldovia. And Darlene Crawford is, is on this uh, meeting as well. And 
she's been taking photos. She is that person, you know, going around town, always had a camera with the long lens and, and was always taking pictures, but her, she always captured people, families and moments. And now has this treasure trove of, of Seldovia's history over the last three, four decades through photography and shares that with people on a regular basis. So um, I feel like I'm in a good group of people who, who are capturing these moments in time and uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. So thanks to all of you. So uh, I, I titled this Seeing Seldovia Through a Changing Lens. And as we go, you'll find it's really a changing lens and perspective, a changing perspective. And um, I listed it as Dandelion Girl Photography because I'm a lover of all things dandelions. And uh, I developed a dandelions Dandelion Girl Photography page. And it was on Facebook until Facebook killed me and said I was too young. And <laughs> so um, I'm re I had to restart and do it over, but um, I am Dandelion Girl Photography and have a new page. So, oh, John and Elsie, I wanna say Elsie are here and they are new property owners in Seldovia. So welcome to the two of you. So glad you're here. That's great. So now I know everybody. So, um, so Dandelion Girl Photography is, is my moniker, I guess. So that's me. All right, so seeing Seldovia through a changing lens. And I think the next thing I have to figure out is how to let it, okay, there we go. So I just wanted to give a little bit of history. So first of all, as a kid, my family took a lot of trips because our, our relatives live in the lower 48. And so it was always a big adventure to go down to California and see everybody. And when I was seven and eight, seven turning eight, our family took a two month long RV trip around the United States and we hit 34 states in that whole time. And in that time we were using those box cameras. And so you would take your photo and then eventually you would mail in the box and get it developed. And then you get back these little pixie photos and you would hope you would hope that they turned out and a lot of times the light was terrible and things were gray or whatever, but you might have the one picture of the buffalo in the distance, but, um, but that was how we captured our experiences. Uh, but otherwise, they were captured in memories. And so I see my memories. I'm really, this is funny because I'm, I don't know if you can see me, but I'm really engaging <laughs> But I also think maybe you're just seeing the screen of the, so sorry if you're not seeing both, but <laughs> my hands are going everywhere. Um, but we had, that's how we captured our photos. And then as I was getting a little bit older, uh, Mr. Neese became a really important part of my life. And Hal Neese was a man who taught science in Seldovia and he developed our outdoor education program, Project Adventure. And he also developed a, a photography lab in the school and we had the ability to go in and develop film and print our own photos. And he taught us all the, the fine details of photography. And we were using manual cameras and we were using actual uh, film and developing it. But he taught us depth of field and how to place a photo, place an image. And he really inspired us with our photography. And if you kind of take a snapshot of children who grew up in Seldovia as uh, eventually teenagers, um, there's a whole chunk of people who were inspired by his photography um, efforts. And he also did community schools classes. And so adults in the community would come up and learn how to do photography as well. So he was part of part of my history in, in regards to taking photos. Journalism was another piece. I got involved in Seldovia with the, the Otter Times and we did a school newspaper and I took a lot of photos for that and taking basketball game pictures and such. And I went to college and I got involved there in the school newspaper at the university called the Biola Chimes. And I was the sports editor for the newspaper and did all kinds of sports photography and eventually the overall editor. And photography was just a really large piece of that. 
and one of the things that really stands out in my mind is that I was in Los Angeles, uh, in a suburb of Los Angeles in 1992, in the spring of 1992. And that's the time of the Watts riots. And I had two photographers who were college ROTC students and we lived far enough away from Watts that we weren't at risk at our university, but we actually could see smoke in the air and fires. And I sent those two to Watts to take pictures and they did. <laughs> we won't talk about my judgment at the time, but they did and they came back and they printed these massive black and white prints that I still have in my boxes uh, in the crawl space of my house showing the, the carnage and the damage. Um, at that time. So that's the second Watts riot, riots of 1992. So um, that's just another part of my photography journey, journey I guess. And then um, moving into marketing. So I worked in a soccer environment and uh, worked with professional soccer in Charlotte, North Carolina, and was involved with uh, documenting and, and uh, we didn't have Facebook at the time. So maybe a little bit less than we do we would document now, but documenting and also promoting our, our efforts and our athletes and our camps and our trips and things that we did with, with athletes around the world. And then from there, I made my way through a period of being involved in education and working with children for about oh, 15 plus years, and then landed into this piece of doing marketing at Seldovia Village Tribe. But in all of that time, especially when I returned to Seldovia, I really um, was, the, was drawn to the scenery and the place of Seldovia. And so that starts this next part of what I'd like to share with you um, about in these changing lenses. So my perspective shifted uh, in my time and the things that I did when I returned to Seldovia, I returned in 2005. I taught for a year and then I ran the Boys and Girls Club for three years. And then I came to work for Seldovia Village Tribe. And for the first five years, I had three kids and, and I was just running around all the time. And I was um, driving a car, always driving zip, zip, zip here and there. And so um, for me, I, I wasn't slowing down a lot. I was just, life was going quickly. But at, in 2013, I decided to begin to walk and to walk as much as I could rather than drive. And by 2015, I wanna say, I was full-time walking and not, I moved my vehicle out of the community. I did end up getting a scooter, you guys know, but, but walking is still happening on a regular basis. And it really shifted my perspective on Seldovia and the things that we experience as we are able to take the time to walk. So in her introduction, Tanya said that we've all seen Laurel walking uh, in her coat in the winter time. And so I apologize for what's about to happen because you're gonna see more. So here we go. So winters. Sometimes lovely, sometimes miserable, but getting out there and trying to enjoy it. I gotta give you, there's blackjack, okay. <laughs> but just getting out and being out in all weather. And this is my most recent picture. This was actually just on Thursday, I believe. So, <laughs> but as I did that, as I'm walking along, I would see smaller things that you don't see when you're driving. And I like that there's folks on this, uh, this presentation zoomed in who are also part of that group of walkers and the things that, that they see and that they share um, are incredible. And so this is just my little piece of what I see and just understand that I don't have a lot of knowledge around the things that I see, but I look at it from a different perspective because I have the time to stop and see it. So these rose hips are one of the first things that really drew my eye in the winter times when I was walking and how the frost plays on them and how the red is just a beautiful thing to share in the middle of the winter when things are more harsh in our climate. Um, 
to me, it's a hopeful sign. And so that's something that I'm often drawn to. And as I go through these photos, what's funny is that if I were to go through the photos that I've taken over, say, the last 10 years, I've taken photos of rose hips with frost again and again and again and again. And I don't know how many rose hip photos I need in my life, but I take them because my eye sees it and it sees it differently each time. And so I guess for the person who's out there taking photos, um, I would encourage you to continue to do that type of thing, even if it feels repetitious, because your eyes starts to see things differently. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the different photos of those smaller things that I was seeing. And as I was seeing them, I started to realize that I could also be looking for them. So this leaf for me is an example of something in the color caught my eye and I decided that it was worth going over to that leaf and getting to it and taking that photo of it because I was paying attention. And so that would be my encouragement is that we, we allow the circumstances around us to capture us so that we can have a chance to go and see that moment that maybe we wouldn't have if we were moving at, along at a quicker pace in our life. I guess we can apply that to everything. And things that might be mundane to me are probably some of the most beautiful things. And Darlene, uh, we gotta give credit to Darlene and I'm sorry, <clears throat> all of our invasive species friends here. And I know you've heard this already, but Darlene did work actively to share and spread daisies throughout our area. And I personally enjoy a, a soggy daisy. So thank you, Darlene. And just taking the time to get in and get close to, uh, to a piece of nature and see it, um, see it differently than you see it from a different, uh, further away. And to me, there's not a better painting in the world than the natural paintbrush of nature and, and what um, the different elements do together to create something like that. So. And so with that, uh, my favorite subject, the dandelions of Soldovia, uh, I, I have a whole lot of pictures of dandelions and I, I take them uh, in all different settings in hopes of finding different, different ways to see them. And for me, one of the things that I, I realized, and I'm just not a scientist and I don't, I'm not trained and knowledgeable enough to understand that, that flowers follow the light, but I see it when I take the photo. And so now I'm looking at that photo and I'm like, those, those flowers to me are following the light. And I was like, if the flowers are following the light, then I should follow the light because there's something to be learned in that. And there's a chance of a better photo. So taking the time to be aware of where the light sits. And so again, as a walker, and you're walking in all seasons, um, you'll find that where the light is, at the, depending on the type of the, the time of year, it really impacts what you're gonna see and what the light exposes to your eye. If you look at, if you can see the picture of me, um, behind me is a picture of the Soldovia Slough and the angle of the sun is low, but it's a late summer sun and it's a golden hour. And we like those golden hours. And we'll see more of that as we go through these, this set of photos about following the light. So the sun is off to my, my, my right. And this is, um, I'm hoping that this was early summer because there's still that much snow on the mountains, um, but it's that longer, longer light and it just gives you those nice angles. And so watching for those moments and thinking, even as you go through your day, even if you're rushing from here to there, you know, boy, the sun looks really nice. It's worth going down to the Harbor and seeing what it does in the next 20 minutes. I made a mistake in Arizona. I went to visit my folks the first time down there and I could see that the sun was going to set. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get myself a nice sunset picture in a little bit. And then the next thing I knew that that sun had set so fast, so fast. So, um, 
you know, in there, you got to be ready for it. But the nice thing about Alaska is it gives you that ability to linger with it and spend some time with it. So that's something I encourage everybody to do when you look out and you see, oh, the sun's just at the right place. Let me just take a minute to go, go see what's out there to be seen. And then just really uh, knowing that the light can play in into different levels of um, color and intensity. And, you know, again, it's, it's a, the angle of that light does influence how that picture turns out. Excuse me. <coughs> and for me, my, my biggest takeaway is that I wouldn't see this moment if I was driving. So I guess today's lesson is advocating for walking in Saldovia, but, um, for sure, uh, that that moment, and just it's the right exact uh, lighting. The backlighting was great. And one of the things about a Seldovia summer is how beautiful the leaves like to light up. And so you see that in all of the green behind there, uh, that they really want to give you just a beautiful painting or a beautiful paint stroke of of light played in different ways. And if you watch um, when it's gonna rain, the, you know, those leaves will do a shift and they start to turn upward so that the rain will collect. And that brings a whole different layer of green to the eye as well. So that's always something that I like to, to keep an eye on and look for. Taking, um, taking something Again and again, if I go through my phone, I have a, a plethora of Soldovia slew photos. And for me, that right side of the picture, it's gray. It's maybe would be what I might consider drab, even though it's world-class views. Um, but when the sun just comes right through that, that gap between Vivian's house and the, the Kashavarov's house, right through there, and it just drills in, I mean, that's, to me, that's an exciting thing to capture that moment, you know, and um, I wanted to say just that I'm taking the, the initially when I was walking, I was taking photos with a, a, an actual digital camera with a lens and it ended up getting run over by a forklift um, at the airport in Homer, <laughs> along with a laptop. And I, I, it took me a long time to replace it. And so I switched to really shooting on my phone predominantly. And as technology incre increased with phones, um, then I feel like my photos had a chance to get better. And I do use, this is, I use an iPhone 11 uh, Pro and it's got three lenses and it allows you to do what's called a level one, where basically it's whatever, it, the the lens eye sees is what the photo is and it does a two which is it zooms in or you can do a 0.5 and a 0.5 is really interesting because it takes it out and almost makes a little bit of a a fish eye and the other option inside of the phone photography is what's called a panoramic picture. And this is an example of a panoramic picture where you're extending the lens, you're moving the camera across the view to capture a broader reach of it. So, and that also inside of the panor panoramic picture gives you that one, two and 0.5 option. And so I do play around with those a little bit. Just a little bit more of the certain light, time of day. And one of the things, thinking back to the leaf picture and here to this, this piece of seaweed, which Tanya could identify perfectly. I'm gonna just call it seaweed. Kelp, okay. Um, so with that, and uh, if you can see my image and if you wanna tell me if you can't, I can stop sharing for a second to show you. Can you guys see me? Anybody able to unmute and tell me if you can see me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Cindy and Marianne, appreciate it. So what I have is the, the lens of my camera is at the top right of the camera. 
And so when I'm shooting, that's typically where I'm shooting from. Of course, you can turn and go horizontally to shoot. But in this picture, what I did was I've taken it and I've put the I put the lens at the bottom of the camera. The image is right in front of the lens, and then I'm shooting the whole scene. And so the perspective has dropped down to that lower perspective, reaching up and seeing that whole that whole scene and how the clouds move across the sky. And it allows that seaweed to be the dominant piece at the bottom, but your eye to see the whole thing. So I encourage people to try that, play with the placement of the lens in regards to the object that you're shooting. A lot of times when we're shooting stuff, we're shooting down right on top of it, but you might find that if you get your lens down below, you'll catch some images, even if you're tide pooling or something, you'll catch a piece of the image that your eye doesn't see from looking above. Another thing that I do um, with that, that panorama is that the sideways, like the picture that I was just showing um, of the slough that's panoramic, that's going horizontally, but you can actually take that same thing and you can turn your panoramic picture and go vertically. And that's a wild turnout. And so I would say if you're out at the beach and you're beach combing and you come up along a cliff, just take your phone, put it in that panoramic and then turn it sideways and do vertical up the wall of that cliff and you'll get a really cool picture. And it's something that I only found by playing around with it. Probably people out there know about it, but I'm just, that's my tip for that one. So give it a try. It's a lot of fun. Again, with the light and the flowers turning towards the sun and just a, a note that this image in particular, I use this a lot to, I take it and I put it into my, into an app on my phone and I add happy birthday and I put a person's name and I send it because I don't want to ever forget them. And so I think this is a great way to do that. But you'll find that a lot of the, as I take images, a lot of the times I'm thinking, how can I take that image and use it for a way to share a thought or a concept or information another day. So I have a lot of those pieces that are saved in my phone that I use for, for reproducing um, and putting good thoughts out there. So uh, this is an example of a that 0.5. Uh, so it's kind of zoomed out a little bit and it's fish eye, it fish, is that, I think that's the right term, um, but it gives you a little bit more. And then this one, it's interesting. If you look at the people down in the middle, they are truly centered on that image. A lot of times you want to try to move the focus or you move the person. Well, I guess they're a tiny bit below, but if you move it off a little bit, sometimes that draws a nicer attention to something. But I thought that this one worked. And again, the play of the light with the clouds and the water and um, that was a lot of fun to capture that moment. And I'm very intentional about the bridge area. <laughs> I imagine other people are too. But even if I'm walking to work um, and I, you know, headed there, a lot of times I'll just veer off a little bit and just go over to the bridge. I did that today. I was walking by and I'm like, I'm just going to go to the bridge and look and see what's going on out there today. Because sometimes, you know, Maybe there's a sea lion, it happens and you don't wanna miss it. It's a great thing to capture. So today the water was just exquisitely uh, blue green. It was just gorgeous. So. You know, it's something as simple as your mom's hanging basket. And yet you see your eye catches that, that what the light is doing. And it's like, we're just gonna take a minute. And to me, it, it just provides, it's just such a sense of warmth. And that gives me a sense of summer and Soldovia summer when the heat is on that part of the building and the, the everything's catching it, I feel it. Um, a lot of my photos as I go through and look back over them, they become like a calendar or a, a reverse almanac. I don't know what the word is, but it's like a, a history of what the weather has done, the seasons have been doing. And I find a lot of times I'll go back and look at this date on uh, last year, the year before, the year before that, what was happening at that time. And um, it's a really nice way to record what the what um, nature is doing around you in a moment. And then the phones are great because you can see it all if you're like me and you keep all your photos on your phone. But back up to the iCloud. 
And I just had to throw pumpkin pie in there because he gets a lot of photos taken of him when the sun is coming at the right angle in my house. And I just, um, he's a photo, photographic, photogenic guy. So. Thanks everybody for bearing with me as I go down these photo memory lanes. I hope it's um, good information that I'm sharing and, and encouraging. Uh, oh, somebody says, Cindy mom says, phonology is the word. And Cindy, you jump on and tell me what that was related to. Uh, just a minute ago, you were saying, talking about seasonality and going back and looking at your pictures and how they fit into the cycle of time and weather. And so phonology is the study of when things happen. So if you if you kept a record of when those crocuses start blooming every year, that's phonology. Oh, I love that. I'm yeah. making notes. Thank you. Phenology. <laughs> Man, so I've thought about this thing, and this is, you know, getting into the minutia of life, but Jerry Murray has tracked the weather for every day that he's lived in Saldovia. I guarantee you, cause he, he's able to pull it up and, you know, and I know you can go online and you can, you can pull up what the weather was on a given day. Um, you know, it's got all of it logged in there, but <clears throat> I find a lot of people say, oh, it rained all summer. You ever hear, hear anybody say, oh, it rained all summer? Well, sometimes I think, well, it didn't rain all summer, did it? And I go back to my photos and I think, okay, well, on that day, there was rain, but there was also clear sky on that day because I've got a picture that shows it, you know? And so I'd love to build like this reverse calendar of, of a picture of every day <laughs> in the year or, you know, just to, to see what all was happening over time because our memories can sometimes tell us, well, honestly, is everybody's memory is telling us that it was never without snow and, and cold this winter, but we know it was, we know it was, there was February, it was great. So then um, the other thing for me is that I think it's important, in, and I talked to slowing down time, um, but I also in my photography will take advantage of slow motion video. And so, um, this is an example of, I guess I'm almost hunting a, an image. I'm hunting a moment or hunting an experience at times where I really know the light is great. And I know that the, there's a setting in town that I wanna capture in the right light, in the right moment. And I'll be intentional to go and find that. And I see that in other people's photography as well and what they share, that there's intentionality in their photos as well. So this for me, again, the dandelion love, I apologize, no, I don't. Um, but what I did was I did, I went here by the fuel tanks and the sun was so fantastic. And I took this slow motion video. And then from that, I actually will typically go back and I will capture a still image that I like from a place in the video. So again, if I'm going along, I can just stop the stop it and then I can take a shot of that actual uh, image and then use that for whatever I want to want to use it for. So. Um, one of the things that comes to me a lot is that I'm not as often inclined to create a situation. So if you think about um, how the eagles act on Saldovia Slough, um, especially around the bridge area, they act differently when somebody has tossed their fish carcasses out onto the slough and the eagles will act up and quite a way, and it's really majestic and exciting. And, you know, there's great photo opportunities and I'm less inclined to take those pictures because it's not the natural, you know, it's been, they've been fed, right? Mm -hmm. And I get that, I get that, that that's, you know, it's cycles back through. But I think last month, the Eagles were naturally acting up and they were acting up everywhere. And that was exciting to me because that's what I wanted to capture. But I will confess that with these dandelions, I did stroke the, you know, 
stroke the leaves to let those guys go loose. And then I ran over so I could get the slow motion image. So uh, just my confession. Okay, you can forgive me or not. I'll let you decide. So, and this is another example of a slow motion video being used to capture an image. So uh, when the waves are breaking and they're doing a great job like that, it's really fun to, to use your slow motion on your camera and um, then go back and capture an image from it. And um, it's also interesting because the more you do those types of things and you're really breaking it down and looking at it closely, the more you know what to be looking for in future experiences around town. For me, you know, so the more time I spend with the photos that I have or with the things that I've taken, then I feel like it sharpens my um, ability to, to find and capture cool things in the future. But I'll just tell you once again, I feel um, greatly inspired and motivated motivated by the folks that are also doing that and sharing their stuff because they're going out Aaron's a great example running running the coastline in the dead of winter getting on top of mountains and things that I'm not going to do but it's 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 inspiring and it's educational and it's exciting and motivating and I think if we think about it for all of us Seldovia is our muse and um all of us see Seldovia from different perspectives, but we get to see that shared, that have that shared experience. And I love it. So, um, so the other thing is that finding peace is a really big part of the, the experience for me here. And sometimes it's my piece and sometimes it's somebody else's piece. And this was, this was Todd's piece as he was, was going through the slough. Um, but it created such a peaceful experience or visual image that it was what I, I enjoyed capturing it. Just so you know, this is, I'll give some credit to Brett and Joe Fleckenstein and Andrew, but uh, Joe owns this property right here across from my house. And, and he has said that um, he's always welcome, glad to have it clear so that there's a good view. And Brett and Andrew came through and cleared some trees and uh, some branches and made it so it's really great. So I go out every day and I take a picture out of there and um, just just enjoy seeing the swans and the, the tide coming and going and the otters and all of it. So I'm really appreciative of that, that extra picture into that area. So. so finding peace, finding simplicity, and taking time to reflect. When I was a little girl, my family moved from Kenny Lake, which is outside of Glen Allen, to Seldovia. <clears throat> my folks had, had decided they needed to come down to this moderate climate uh, for my oldest sister who had some health issues. And they interviewed in Homer for a job where dad would be the vice principal at the high school. And then they heard about the new school that had been built in Seldovia and that there were positions here. So they took the ferry and they came over. And as they came around the corner, dad says, uh, forget Homer. And mom said, thank you, God. And that was in 1970. And our family moved here and they showed up with my folks and five kids with the babe in arms and they had a green step van, like a milk truck van. And that's what we were in. And we were just, we would drive around town. My dad was driving around town looking for somewhere for us to live. And somebody at the city office said, well, there is a guy who owns a piece of property in Seldovia, but he lives in Kodiak, but we think he'd be willing to sell the house. And that house is that house right there. Uh, it didn't look like that at the time. But um, we moved into that house that's there on the boardwalk right above Susie's place. And we lived in there for four or five years. And right below was a trailer where Nick Hoganson lived, which is now this area, Hoganson Park. And so um, I guess for me, this picture kind of represents 50 years of change in my life in Seldovia and the lens and perspective of it. But it's given me a lot of joy and I'm, I'm glad to be able to um, experience it and share it with you all. And I thank you all for taking the time to, to listen in and, and look with me. And um, I, think, I think I have one more slide. 
But for me, it's uh, all how God just um, reveals himself in nature and in setting and in place and in uh, seasons and in people. And so you guys are all a part of that for me, um, being a great part of the Soldovia experience and journey. And I appreciate y'all for joining in. And I will open it up for questions if, or thoughts if anybody has, and I'm gonna stop sharing. So other folks on this call are great photographers as well. So if you have tips or ideas or anything to share, hi, Brett. We've got Liz here too. She, she's, she was up to play a game. So, so, so we have a, a pretty crowd here. Uh, you've got more people than the number of Zoom, Zoom participants. Okay, Jonathan, make yeah. note, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there's seven. Um, We've got seven, I think. Seven yeah, oh, yeah. wow, great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was just gonna. It's just I, I loved your presentation. That was really great. And I was thinking yeah. of one thought I had halfway through was that it'd be really fun to like get together for like naturalist photo walks, like no leader, just kind of casually go wander around a little bit. And like I love that the sort of like photography you're doing here. I I really enjoyed doing that too. So anyway, I I really enjoyed it. Thank you for for uh, for sharing. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate it. Laurel, I, I feel like I learned a lot from you. The idea of turning your phone upside down to get the lens lower, I never thought of that. And what was the other thing? Oh, using your slow motion video and then to get a still. I have gotten you know, screenshots from video, but not from slow motion video. So that is really great. It's basically yeah. like, having a slow shutter speed, which yeah. on my, my iPhone seven, I can't control that at all. So Cindy, there is really an cool. app, there is an app that allows for a slow shutter speed, but the problem with apps is that they want a newer phone. So, um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah, but thank if you have you. Motion, yeah, that would be great. Those are, those are great tips and ideas that, um, I think you have used to really creative potential. So that was, that was interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. One of the things uh, inside of the marketing is that a lot of the photos that I take will often be the background on things that I push out for work or um, just memes or things that I post or share personally, et cetera. And now I find myself actually taking photos with that in mind. And so I'll frame a photo differently to allow for maybe some blank space that, um, that words could be added or information could be added later. And so um, I have a good collection of those that I'm building into my, my phone albums as well, I guess, uh, to you. So I, one of the things is um, my phone, my phone, the whole reason Facebook killed me was that my phone had died in September and I had to replace my phone. But in the meantime, I was using my iPad for Facebook and I you, I couldn't get logged in correctly. And when you have double authentication, this is my warning for everybody. When you have double authentication set up and it needs a text from your phone, if you don't have a working phone, you can't authenticate that way. And what I found inside of Facebook was that when I tried to then authenticate through email, it would never go through. And then Facebook said I was too young to have Facebook. So I did all of the right things. I provided my driver's license twice, but two times and you're out and they killed me and they killed me hard. And so one, please note that if you have a page that you administrate on Facebook that you administer, if you don't have anybody else who is an editor or an administrator on that page and Facebook kills you, that page dies as well. So I learned my lesson. And so any new page that I make has a second person who's an editor on it. Um, also, it will kill your Instagram, it'll kill your WhatsApp and it'll kill um, Messenger. It's not a pretty experience. And the same thing happened to Susie and it's all glitch inside of the Facebook system. So that's just my warning for everybody. But one of the good things people ask me all if I lost my photos and Facebook is not where my photos live. They're just where they're shared, but my photos live in my possession, my property. So a lot of people will post a picture to Facebook and then delete it. And if you do that, it's gone. Don't, don't expect to see it again. 
Sorry, that's just my little rant. <laughs> no, that th those are great tips as well because I do uh, I administer the Seldovia Public Library page, and I think I'm the only one on there. So yeah. that's a really good tip. So I do you. have a faux personality, and so um, you can so so what I did to become who I am now on Facebook because it wouldn't let me connect to my existing phone number. It wouldn't let me go back as Laurel Hiltz. Um, and it wouldn't let me use my, my traditional email address. So I had to use a different phone number, make a whole different email address. And i um, just went by my first and middle name. So nobody can search me. They can't find me by my, by Laurel Hiltz at all, because I can't be that person on Facebook anymore. So it's, it's unfortunate. It's, it's, it's a hard thing. The hardest thing for me is losing albums in terms of how things were grouped and how I could easily go to those albums. But the worst part was losing Messenger because I lost all my contact with people throughout the community and um, around the world. And when you go to Ukraine all the time and you meet a lot of people whose names are spelled in Ukrainian or Russian, you never can find them ever again. So I lost all those people, but that's just my warning, sorry. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we wrap up our time? That was awesome, Laurel. I really like your philosophical approach to it. It just all really gelled really nicely. It was oh, lovely. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending. And I want to say it's Elsie and her husband that joined in and we'll look forward to seeing you somewhere along the road walking and taking in the beautiful setting and scenery of Seldovia. Hey. Hey, thank, thank you. Thank you. This was a real pleasure to join in. We appreciate it being part of it. We're calling in from Wonder. here. All right. Well, good. And we'll be looking forward to the nature walk, Brett. Um, there is a nature, nature walk with Tanya and Cindy on April 10th. Tanya, is that a Saturday? My brain. This is Sunday it's Sunday afternoon. So be looking for no, uh, it's info. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Okay. Be watching for information on that. You guys, what um, time? what's the time, Cindy? Nine o'clock meet at the Gateway Pavilion. Perfect. And I'm planning to, I'm not sure which direction clockwise or counterclockwise, but we'll do the slough up shoreline drive to outside beach and then back on the Otterbahn or else we'll do it the other direction. So if you want a shorter walk, you could spot a car out at outside beach or at the school, that would be another place to leave a car. So if you wanted to bail, you could, or a bicycle, um, you could leave early instead of doing the whole entire walk will be about three and a half miles if you do the whole thing. That sounds really wonderful. That's great. And with the way that the rate of the daylight is going, we're at 14 and a half hours from dawn till dusk. And uh, December 21st was 7.5 hours, I think. So um, it's all worth celebrating. So um, get out there and enjoy it. So thank you, everybody. Hi, Laurel. Yes, darling. Hi, Laurel. This is Colleen. I just want to say thank you. And I learned some stuff too. It was very interesting. And I like your pictures always. Thank you, darling. Thank you. All right. On that note, we'll say good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night.